Welcome to another Chem 1A lecture video with Professor Brooks. In this video, we'll be focusing on molecular shape. The specific learning objectives that you should gain from watching this video and doing the assigned practice work is the ability to predict electron and molecular geometry using the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Along with that objective, comes the idea of how lone pairs can affect the bond angles when we look at molecular geometry. Valence shell electron pair repulsion is sometimes abbreviated as VESPER. Our previous lessons on Lewis bonding theory allowed us to predict the bonding interactions between atoms and to determine the number of bonding groups versus lone pair electrons surrounding an individual atom. These bonding and non-bonding electrons will arrange themselves around an atom such that they are as far apart from each other as possible because the negative charge of the electrons is repelling. This gives us a series of predictable shapes that are described by Vesper theory. Some of the most basic shapes are shown at the bottom of the slide here. Each shape explains both the orientation of the atoms to each other and also the angles formed by any three atoms. For instance, if we have a molecule that is composed of only three atoms, the only way those three atoms could be joined is in a line. Therefore, if we look at the bond angle from this green atom on the right through the center atom through to the other green atom, that is an angle of a complete 180 degrees. And the structure looks like a line, so we call this a linear molecule. When we have three electron groups around our central atom, those three groups will point as far away as possible from each other, essentially pointing to the three corners of a triangle. This shape is flat in that it can be easily represented in two dimensions. So we have give it the name trigonal planar, meaning triangular and flat. And the bond angle between any two of the bonds is 120 degrees. When we have four or more groups around our central atom, we now need to look at three-dimensional space. In order for four groups to spread out as far as possible, we need to create the shape of a tetrahedron. So this geometry is called tetrahedral, and all of the bonds are exactly 109.5 degrees apart from each other. With five groups, we have the trigonal bipyramidal shape. This gets its name because it's basically a linear shape combined with the trigonal planar shape. So around the center, we see uh, three of the electron groups coming out on a plane at 120 degree angles from each other. And then perpendicular to the plane of this triangle, we have this axial pole where we have one bond going straight up and one bond going straight down. When looking at the trigonal bipyramidal shape, it's important to note that we have two types of angles going on. The angle between the bonds around the uh, center triangle are all going to be 120 degrees away from each other. However, because the bonds pointing up and down are exactly perpendicular to the plane of the triangle, then one of these vertical bonds would be 90 degrees away from one of the kind of horizontal bonds. The most complex shape that you'll be asked to look at is that which forms an octahedron. So an octahedron is like the Egyptian pyramids, one against each other to make a diamond-like shape. So we have basically a four-sided plane. We have essentially a square being formed by uh, four bonds coming out from the central atom in a plane. And so those four bonds are all 90 degrees apart from each other. And then we also have a vertical set of bonds going up and down 
and those would also be 90 degrees from each other. So a octahedral shape is actually very symmetrical and could be oriented any way and all the bond angles would be the same. You may recognize these shapes from our earlier lessons on valence bond hybridization. So there's a convention that's set up for representing three-dimensional shapes on a 2D surface. And what I'm showing you here, you may recognize from an art class you had back in grade school. This is an example of a drawing in perspective. And you'll know that when we draw in perspective, in order to show that something is far, far away, we show that our uh, street here, as it gets further and further away, becomes narrower and comes to a point. So we're going to use this concept from pers perspective drawing to illustrate our bonds as they go into the distance or come out towards us. So the convention is, when we're drawing our bonds, if we want them to exist on the same plane as the paper, meaning they are flat, then we would draw them in the typical way as a straight line. If we want to say that that bond goes behind the page of the paper, we show it fading away into the distance with a hatched wedge. And if that bond would be sticking out of the paper coming towards you in a three-dimensional space, then we draw the solid wedge. So that's kind of looking like our highway from the previous drawing here. So here are some examples showing the different three-dimensional shapes with actual elements, atoms of actual elements included. So we see a molecule of beryllium with two hydrogen atoms attached. This structure has only two groups of electrons, so it would be sp hybridized. And because it is linear, it can easily be shown on the page exactly as so. So when we get to four electron groups, that's where we're first looking at um, tetrahedral geometry. And the molecule we're looking at here is called methane. And so the way that methane is represented is we put two of the bonds flat on the page. And so that means that the other two of bonds, which are 109.5 degrees apart from each other, one is coming out at us, solid wedge, and the other is going into the paper, the dashed wedge. Here we see an example of a trigonal bipyramidal drawing. So we've got our vertical bonds and one of our uh, planar triangle bonds on the paper and the other two bonds of that horizontally oriented triangle are coming out up towards us and into the paper. And finally, we have an example of the octahedral representation. So let's practice these concepts uh, by drawing out the Lewis structure for phosphorus pentachloride. I'd like you to assign the electron and molecular geometry and then indicate the bond angles. Pause the video now and work through the problem and then resume once you're done. You may have started out with a simple Lewis structure showing that the phosphorus is going to use its five valence electrons to form bonds to the five chlorines, and the remainder of the electrons on the chlorines will exist as lone pairs. This is a accurate Lewis structure, but it does not show an accurate depiction of the shape of this molecule. What I'm looking at on the page now looks like a flat molecule, something like a star. And that would mean that the angles between each of the chlorines is only 72 degrees. However, if we use our shapes from valence bond hybridization theory and from Vesper theory, we can reorient the chlorines such that we have them in a trigonal bipyramidal orientation. And so now we can see that the chlorines are able to get farther away from each other, so their electrons are having less of a repulsive force as they near the other bonded atoms. Here's a second example looking at the polyatomic ion sulfate. We would start with a Lewis structure as shown here and then rearrange the molecule to represent a tetrahedral geometry.
Notice now that the tetrahedral geometry includes one of the groups as a lone pair. I chose to orient my sulfite molecule in this manner because it's difficult to show three-dimensional shape with a lone pair. I also chose to put the double bond on the plane of the paper to make my life easier as well. One thing that's interesting is that lone pairs are not only difficult to arrange on a three-dimensional drawing, but they also have an overall impact on the shape of the molecule. This brings us to a difference in the terms for electron geometry versus molecular geometry. The electron geometry of sulfite is tetrahedral because it has one, two, three, four electron groups around it. However, if we were to look at this molecule um, through X-ray diffraction or other forms of spectroscopy, we would see more um, of the matter actually contained just within these three electron groups because they're pointing towards the oxygen atoms and we wouldn't actually be able to see the lone pair. Let's explore that a little further. Lone pairs do occupy space around a central atom and they will um, repel the electrons that are in the bonding pairs but they're not really seen as points within the shape of a molecule. So when we're talking about molecular geometry, we look at the shape of the molecule should we ignore the actual lone pair electrons. When we do that, we have to also account for the fact that lone pair electrons generally sit closer to the atom and form a more broad cloud of electron density than bonding pairs. And so lone pairs essentially push down on the bond angles of the bonding electrons. In this example, I'm showing three different representations of molecules that would have the same electron geometry, but different molecular geometry. So the electron geometry in methane, ammonia, and water are all tetrahedral. There are four electron groups. However, if we're talking about the molecular geometry, we only look at the geometry formed by bonded atoms. So methane would have a, a molecular geometry of tetrahedral, whereas ammonia with the lone pair at one of the points on the tetrahedron would have this new geometry called trigonal pyramidal. So basically we're forming a little pyramid with three sides, so that is trigonal pyramidal. In the case of water, two of the electron groups are lone pairs, and so if we were focusing just on the atoms, we would get kind of a boomerang-like shape, which is given the name bent. As I mentioned, by having lone pairs on a central atom, there is an impact on the angles of the bonds around that atom. So in the case of methane, all of the electron groups are equal in that they are all bonds to hydrogen. So we have a bond angle of 109.5 no matter which angle we choose. In the case of ammonia, that electron cloud at the top of the molecule is pushing down on the lower bonds such that we get an angle of about 107 degrees between those hydrogen to nitrogen to hydrogen atoms. With water having two lone pairs, that bond becomes even tighter and has an angle of approximately 104.5. Table 11.1 .1 from your textbook illustrates all of the names of the shapes of the different electron and molecular geometries, as well as the approximate bond angles for all of the possibilities that you'll be seeing as you go through your practice problems. So I recommend you take a good look at that resource. I'm going to leave you with one last practice problem. Where should you place the lone pair electrons on the structure of sulfur tetrafluoride? Hint, the lone pairs will occupy a region with the most open space.
All right, good luck and see you next time.